We have noted on the other evenings that we would devote a little time to certain marginalia concerning General Pike and some of the points in connection with his life and research which we think may be of interest uh, to those of our students who are searching for better foundation work in early comparative religion. Well, when I was in Washington a number of years ago, it occurred to me that it was quite possible that Brady, the Civil War photographer, uh, who is famous for his photographs of Grant and Lincoln, and other outstanding persons of the period, might have done something pictorially in connection with General Pike. Uh, the House of the Temple did not have any records that such were the case, but I browsed around Washington and I found, found out that Brady had taken some pictures of General Pike, and I was able to secure one, which I think is not too bad, for it shows the general in one of his most natural and picturesque uh, postures, working with his oversized German pipe, which he uh, greatly favored. This is one of Brady's photographs of General Pike, taken probably in the early 80s, or uh, when the general was, as he called it himself, in the prime of his advancing years, <laughs> uh, which is a rather good term for it, I think. So I thought perhaps it would be nice to take, uh, show you this picture, and later why well, you can look at it more in detail if you wish to. We seem to be without any uh, place to put it, so we hope the general will not feel humiliated. I'm sure he would not. Now also in connection with this point, I'd like to uh, make a few remarks based upon an early uh, study of General Pike, which records a phase of him which I do not find in any of his official biographies. This is by um, illustrious brother Henry Ridgely Evans, Grand Tyler of the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. He says, General Pike was deeply versed in the philosophy of Vedanta. Uh, this is something that we uh, perhaps might not be quite so uh, well acquainted with and as much, of course, as this was many years before the great uh, World Congress of Religions, which brought the Swami Vivekananda to this country. And up to that time, only a very few individuals, perhaps Emerson and a few others, were really aware of this particular philosophy. The author of this article continues, with all his studies in the mysticism of the Orient, he, he ever maintained his mental equipoise, his fine analytic and discriminating power. All that he wrote was tempered with philosophic insight. He fully appreciated the spiritual profundities of the Vedas and the Zendavesta, and sought to link the Orient with the Occident. He was indeed an emperor of the East and West, which incidentally is a Masonic term, whose true symbol was the double-headed eagle. Uh, this point that he was acquainted with and familiar with, a subject such as Vedanta, uh, sort of moves him again into a slightly different category when we are studying the things that he did. A little human episode, I think, is indicative of Pike's position. Uh, we know that he lived in one of the most uh, turbulent periods in American history, and that he was in the middle of it that practically all of his life, until he finally retired to Washington, D.C., was in the field as a pioneer in law and letters, in poetry and in military strategy, and many, many other things. But in the year 1886, John Hallam was at that time writing his biographical and pictorial history of Arkansas. Um, uh, incidentally, Pike had been one of the first citizens of Arkansas. Begged General Pike to give him some facts concerning his varied and picturesque career. Pike complied with the request, remarking, I have often refused to write an autobiographical sketch for publication, not through delicacy or modesty, but because I could truly say with the needy knife grinder, story, God bless you, 
I have none to tell, sir. None I know that would be worth anyone's reading. I am perfectly conscious that I have no aptitude for that type of authorship, and that if I were to undertake it, the result would be stale, flat, and unprofitable. And General Pike, to the end of his life, insisted that nothing interesting had ever happened to him. <laughs> this is another uh, sidelight on a very interesting man, but shows uh, some of the peculiarities uh, that we often find with that type of person. I'll find I have all these things spread out just the way I want them. <laughs> now, uh, I want to uh, point out one uh, situation that Pike faced early in his studies of comparative religion because I think it has a direct bearing on us work this evening. Uh, while he was still practicing law in Arkansas and recovering from the numerous trials and tribulations of the Civil War, he was working on his manuscripts, and one of the most interesting of these is the Indo-Aryan Deities and Worship, in which he attempts a study of the Rig Veda. In introducing this subject, Pike goes over most of the available authorities of his time and points out that there is a serious difficulty which no one seems to have been able to um, solve. And that is that we not only have to find out what the original author meant, but when we find out and we make even a most accurate and careful translation, we are still in no position to know that we have transmitted his idea. This is a, a very difficult situation because we have to use words that were unknown to him. We have to take concepts for which he had particular terms and we, had to, we have to try to find uh, some way of expressing things familiar to him in words that he never heard of. Now, it's not only that we might be wrong, but he cannot uh, use censorship over the fact that his own language has changed, that even the most careful scholarship runs against a number of very difficult situations, as I attempted to point out in one of the earlier talks building up to this particular point. And in order to explain his own position, General Pike gives us some interesting words and terms which we all use every day, and then asks us what they mean. And so in this particular uh, context, I think it might be interesting to follow some of his researches in words, just for maybe five minutes, to see how he approached a problem which most scholars have never yet been able to solve in a manner sac uh, satisfactory to others, even if satisfactory to themselves. As a very good scholar in Latin and Greek, uh, Pike chose a good many of his uh, terms for consideration at this moment uh, from these languages because of their gradual descent into our popular tongue. He starts here by using or giving us the word sacrament. Now there is a term which we think we know what it means. But let us see, according to uh, Pike, what the original word meant. Now, supposing we found in a text the, uh, the Latin term sacramentum, just exactly what do we mean? Do we mean that this individual uh, took some holy and sacred obligation or something of that kind? Literally not. That is not the meaning of the word. Uh, the word means a deposit or a pledge made by a party in a legal suit in Rome. In other words, it begins as a legal term. Afterwards, it meant a military oath, usually an obligation to Caesar or the state. And after that, it meant any kind of an oath on any subject, and finally moved into our uh, usage, which actually does not mean an oath at all. We do not have the same meaning whatsoever. Now, a word that we all use a great deal, Pike gives a little study to, and that is the word pagans. We now think of pagans as people whose faith 
is different from ours or who do not believe in one of the three religions to which we do not apply the term pagan, namely Christianity, Muslimism, and Judaism. All other religions we consider as pagan. Pike tells us, for example, that the Pagani were originally those people who lived in small villages and towns. That's what it means. Just a small town, folks. And that the... Uh, uh, that as Christianity in its development uh, gathered to itself more and more of those living in metropolitan areas or in the larger communities, uh, those were no, who were not converted were the ones in the small towns and in the distant places and in the villages and on the farms and things of that nature where the doctrine had actually not reached. Therefore, there, those who had not yet heard about it and therefore did not believe in it were the village dwellers, or the pagans. And that's all the term means, actually. It has nothing to do with whether you're a good man or a bad man or a true believer or a false believer. It simply means that you lived out on a farm or in some small town where you did not enjoy the advantages of being able to listen to the sermons of the various preachers. That's approximately all the word means. But it certainly doesn't mean that anymore. And if the word pagan has come into ill repute, Pike points out the poor word heathen is in still worse <laughs> trouble. Now uh, what is a heathen? A heathen is supposed to be a false uh, person in false religious conviction. Therefore it may be interesting to know that the word heathen originally uh, meant one of the wild tribe of Germans who lived on the heaths. <laughs> In other words, it was a heath dweller, a person who lived uh, out in these great lands, and of course something like the pagans or the small town people were a little outside of the odor of sanctity. They hadn't, it hadn't got there yet. So when we, uh, when we say to a man today, I think you're a heathen, I wonder if we really mean we think he lives on a wild heath and that also he is of Teutonic extraction. We probably do not. But when these words are used, uh, we have trouble with them. And we also have trouble wherever popular idiom gradually changes the meaning of things. A few more of his uh, thoughts here would also perhaps be pleasant. The word passion originally simply meant suffering. So when an individual is described as passionate, it means he is suffering severely. Now that, that may not be perhaps quite the meaning we have now, but that's what it originally means. Now Pike, perhaps by uh, the law of association as advanced by Dr. Seabury, also came to the conclusion that he should put the word libertine along with the passionate man. Perhaps this is just a, an idea. But what does the word libertine mean? We have an idea that it means an individual of loose morals. Maybe you'll be surprised to read, uh, to find that the original meaning is a free thinker. A libertine is an individual who dare to think his own thoughts. A liberal. But hardly is that the meaning with which we associate the word today. The word plague, meaning now an epidemical disease or some malady of that kind, merely means to be struck a blow. Well, of course, actually, I suppose if you get the plague, it is a bit of a blow. But uh, anyway, it, uh, it means to strike a blow. And our word pain does not mean suffering at all. It means punishment. Well, perhaps it's true that many times our pain is a form of punishment. Perhaps the older man was wiser than we are. But when an individual says he is in pain, it means he is under punishment. But again, we have lost the meaning of that. I like the original meaning of the word obsolete. Uh, we think of it, for instance, as meaning something that is far behind, out of style, no longer used, and so on. It means, actually, that a thing has lost its odor. A bouquet of flowers which no longer have any scent might be said to be obsolete because it has to lose its savor, its smell, or its scent in order to be obsolete. Well, I don't know, but uh, that's a rather a stretch from our present um, meaning. 
We also have the word derivative, which we incline to uh, term, uh, to relate to the term derive, or to come from. It actually means to take water out of the river. Now, you can imagine what you'd have to do when you start reading sacred books, <laughs> trying to figure out the difference between popular meaning and real meaning, or between original meaning and surviving meaning. It could be very difficult. Attached means to put your finger out and touch something. It doesn't mean to take hold of it or to be fastened to it. It merely means to touch it. That again would be a form of attachment that would be rather gentle for our present thinking. We have the word firmamentum, uh, which we now tie with the concept of firmament or heaven. Originally, firmament was a foundation for a fort. It arises from our term fortis, which means to fortify or to make strong, and strength, prop, to hold up. Well, it now means the sky, which you would scarcely be entirely in the original thinking. When we endorse a man's character, it means simply uh, that we do something on his back from in dorsal on the back so we can endorse a check on the back that is quite correct but when we endorse a man's character it means we would have to sign an affidavit on his back or something of that kind to make our meaning actually true our word disposition actually means to put in order and how many people's dispositions are worthy of that claim and finally, Pike gives us the term provisions, now meaning food, from provisio, which simply means foresight. Therefore, foresight, uh, perhaps associated with the animal storing up its food for the winter, is the origin of our word provision. It does not mean actually food stuff now, but we think of putting away food stuff as foresight against hunger. Now these are examples that he gives uh, to show what happens when you start trying to put languages together or take them apart for that matter and that it's much easier sometimes to take them apart than it is to put them together. And he also points out that it is much easier to differ from the authorities than it is to correct them. And that difference is easy, but to come up with something that is really solutional is not quite so easy. So this is another little insight, not only into his thinking, but perhaps into relatively important thinking for all of us in connection with the exactness of terms. Now in his researches into the Persian religion, Pike takes an attitude which perhaps is uh, rather important to us. It might, um, it might mean that before we get through with it, we'll spend a good deal of the evening on his attitude, but I think it is one that is essentially valuable and strangely enough he does not uh, uh, make this uh, basic concept from a quotation from the Avesta or one of the sacred books of the Persians but from the Phaedo of Plato he quotes Socrates where Socrates says of the, uh, the great uh, initiatory institutions of the ancients it well appears that those who established the mysteries or secret assemblies of the initiates were no contemptible personages but men of great genius who in the early ages strove to teach us under enigmas that he who shall go to the invisible region without being purified will be precipitated into the abyss while he who arrives there purged of the stains of this world and accomplished in virtue will be admitted to the dwelling place of the deity. The initiated are certain to attain to the company of the gods. This is from Socrates. Now this is basically uh, the premise upon which a very large part of his Avestan researches are based. First of all then, let us try to restore his thinking. According to Pike, 
And the researches in the early and basic religions of the Persians uh, have led him to certain conclusions. One is that what we call the stream of the ancient Persian wisdom is one of the earliest streams of religious knowledge in the world. That it probably goes back far enough so that Pike says in the opening of his lectures on the areas, referring to the Rig Veda, he says the second oldest book in the world. Uh, he does not at that point name the oldest, but from the general consensus of his thinking, he does not believe necessarily that the Avestas are the oldest but he believes that the stream of tradition uh, which later became embodied in the Avestic literature is one, if not the earliest, certainly the earliest that we can identify of the great wisdom religious systems of the world. Now, uh, Pike apparently had some reservations concerning the interpretation of the Persian sacred writings by the Persians themselves. He seems to have taken the ground that the ancient Persian writings are not much more available uh, to the average modern believer today and are not available in very much better condition than the sacred writings of most other great peoples. In other words, he takes the attitude that there is a peculiar and strange dark curtain that has fallen over all religions. That this curtain fell at some undetermined date. And he likes to symbolize it by the fact that each religion of the world passes through the experience of losing the key to its own doctrine. That this key becomes lost. The books don't become lost. The descent of the hierarchs, the uh, priests, and the teachers, this descent does not seemingly cease. But there seems to be a point in all the religions of men where certainty fades away and where in the place of certainty man falls into opinion. And in the place of assurance of things he falls into interpretation about which there is an endless divergence of opinion. And Pike takes the point that wherever there is a tremendous division of opinion, there is a poverty of fact, because we are not divided on any matter in which we are certain. We are divided by our uncertainties, particularly in matters of religion and philosophy. And if the primordial religion of man was available in its original pristine beauty, Pike takes the ground that probably no one would resent it or oppose it, but that all down through time there has been a falling away from the power of exactitude, and that in this great drift of ages, marked by the destruction of ancient works, uh, by the uh, scattering of peoples, uh, by the gradual uh, interchange of racial beliefs and doctrines, that the purities of the lines of descent of tradition have gradually been corrupted. So that today, as he expresses it in his own words, religion has gradually moved into the position of a powerful, ethical, a powerful ethical structure of believing. And that religion today is measured by the individual's acceptances of certain things as true the acceptances of certain ethical codes about which there seems to be less division of opinion than upon more abstract theological questions. Thus men still are more or less agreed as to the nature of honesty, but they are not at the moment in very solid agreement as to the nature of first cause or any of these great abstractions which um, mark the foundations or beginnings of practically all of the world's faiths. Thus Pike takes the attitude that there is a key which opens the structure of these ancient teachings and that this key is lost. If not lost, it is unfortunately mislaid. 
it is not available to us when we most need it and most want it. And in the place of this key, men have fashioned many keys, and some of them seem to fit fairly well. But it was Pike's opinion that these keys did not actually turn the lock correctly, that they did, make, did not make available the point uh, which is of the greatest basic interest or the greatest basic value. Pike then points out that his assumption is based upon a number of, of points which he considers to be highly relevant. He sees in a certain central area involving uh, the great complex of Persian Aryan peoples, a center from which radiating outward in almost all directions streams of culture flowed like rivers of life uh, to make fertile the religions and cultures of a great many peoples. He is convinced from his study of ancient languages and ancient teachings that there are vestiges, evidences, fragments, perpetuations of this ancient Iranian faith to be found in almost all of the surviving religions of the world. He believes also that to a great degree many of these faiths are the direct outgrowth of ideas and teachings which have apparently vanished in their own homeland, that they are no longer available in the place where they came from, and that by degrees they have moved away into these other groups. But Pike points out, if all of these other groups hold certain doctrines, ideas, or principles in common, and all these groups have a certain dependency, which is obvious in their ritualism, obvious in their symbolism, obvious even in their languages. Then the various productions which arise as the result of this central force must have within themselves some more than incidental borrowings, some more than incidental fragments of the original teaching. Thus Pike, beginning, for example, by studying the Kabbalah and uh, the, uh, the ancient writings in the Valley of the Euphrates, moving into Hinduism and Buddhism, going down into Egyptian philosophy and finally over into Greek philosophy, particularly the Orphic and Pythagorean schools, he finds in all of these groups indications that a tradition of some kind, a tradition no longer directly available, even in the Persian religion, came from Persia, or came from that general area, and that this tradition carried to a dozen other localities has survived in all of these localities. Therefore, at least potentially, it must be assumed that they were also in the original locality which was the source of these migratory uh, procedures. Pike then, in his researches, was seeking for the evidence of what he regarded as the essential principles of the wisdom religion. He was convinced that when he refers to the wisdom religion, he is referring to something that had a valid existence. He is not merely speaking in his thinking of an abstract symbolic term. He is thinking that uh, there was, at a remote time, a highly organized faith, a more or less complete or total structure of religious insight, that this religious insight was not theological primarily, but completely philosophical and scientific. In other words, he is probing for what the alchemists in the Middle Ages called the exact science of human salvation. He believes that such a science existed, that this science was just exactly as orderly and inevitable as mathematics, and that the regeneration of man is a process for which there is an exact methodology. 
that this methodology underlies uh, the so-called claims, or to some people pretensions, of ancient peoples to possess this knowledge. And Pike is convinced that men of the caliber of Socrates, and of Plato, and of Pythagoras, and many others in other parts of the world, could not have been deceived in this matter. That these men were aware that religion divides into two distinct parts that the core of it, the essential part of it, is this sacred science, which he calls the wisdom religion. And that the second part of it was the sacerdotal art, or the theological aspect, which had as its perhaps its prominent and most important function that of the ethical development of man. Pike therefore goes on to take the position that it was the purpose of this twofold structure to continue to bring to the attention of men, of mortal persons, the tremendous need for the enlightenment, improvement, and perfection of themselves. That the outer part of this, or the exoteric body of religion, consisted of a great group of moral, ethical virtues virtues founded in purification, consecration, devotion, and that the individual who accomplished to a great degree these matters was entitled, as he points out in the early Persian lore, to seek and find one of the holy teachers, the good ones, who could show him the way to that which was locked behind uh, the veil of the inner teaching. Thus, the virtues constituted the probationary part of religion. That the living of the good life, the thinking of the good thought, this, uh, these qualities made man ready to know. Because by means of these qualities, man claimed the moral birthright of his own humanity. Man stood up then and said, I am worthy. I have proved my worthiness. But Pike does not believe that religion ends in the proof of worthiness. This is important. It is the beginning. But that the good man is not the complete and total purpose of religion. That the purpose of religion is that it shall take over in some mysterious way the good man and make him the truly wise man. And that the wise man, in this case, is the individual who has received the secrets of the divine life, the secret of the release of his own godhood, and the secret of the means by which he will ultimately be restored to unity with the total divinity of life and space. That this has to be an exact process, that hoping, believing, will help, but that just as hoping and believing will not allow an inexperienced man to perform a delicate piece of surgery, or even a great and devout uh, believing will enable a man who has never played the piano to become inst instantly a musician. So hope and believing are not in themselves substitutes for actual knowledge that they are the moral forces by which man is sustained in his search for knowledge, but that this knowledge stands apart, stands like some strange mysterious sphinx upon the desert of waiting, and that this sphinx, locking within itself the secret of man's divine birthright, that this sphinx must be questioned by a knowing Oedipus who is able to take from the sphinx the secret of its riddle, and thus end forever the mystery with which truth is shrouded. To attain this purpose, then, Pike begins to search what he calls the monuments of time, to discover whether his position is valid. In his work on the uh, Indo-Aryans that we have just mentioned, Pike says in the preface that this monograph was never intended for publication. 
It represented only his own research, and it was not published until many years after his death. It was simply the record, the daily record of his own searching. It was the step-by-step -step unfoldment of his own purpose. And he said many steps had to be retraced and taken over again, and that he had to discard along the way many of the most uh, attractive so-called discoveries that he had made. And he insists in this preface also that as a lawyer, as a thinker, as a man of training, he did not reason from a conclusion. He tried to reason toward one, keeping his mind open to negation even to the end, willing to accept any absolute truth or complete fact, even though it swept away the entire work that he had accomplished. His purpose was, if possible, uh, to reveal what he felt might be there, but which he could not accept until he had subjected it to the most careful analysis. But at the end of his writing, he tells us that he was fortified in his hope and that although much vanished along the way, and he was forced to break with many authorities, long held as uh, almost sacred, he came finally to the conclusion that the evidence in favor of the original concept was irrefutable, and that this evidence perhaps is nowhere as obvious as it is in this circle, this a diameter of the wheel in which the various nations of the world all indicate that they shared with him this absolute conviction that there was a universal knowing, a universal wisdom reality, and that this universal wisdom reality was certainly a far greater antiquity than we are normally inclined to suspect. Searching further in this field, Pike felt conclusively necessary that we begin to push back the historical boundaries of what we term the era of light. Instead of assuming that light came to this world 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or that man became a sapient creature 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 years ago, that we have to begin to push back this search for the origin of the enlightened man. Actually, it was Pike's conviction that man as man was created or fashioned or came into existence, whether by evolutionary or other processes, that the human being from the beginning possessed the instinct of intelligence that this instinct of intelligence, gradually developing over a great period of time, accomplished far more in its so-called early phases than we are inclined to, exp to suspect. Pike rejects actually and completely the emergence of an enlightened man seven or eight thousand years ago. Even though we cannot by means of any existing historical record, discover the rational pre-Egyptian, uh, the rational pre-Greek, the, the rational uh, pre-Semite. Pike insists that this being existed, or that these beings existed, and that actually the streams of our tradition are far older than we suspect. And what we call history is nothing but the record of the decline of truth. Now the reason why it is a record of the decline of truth is that it, like the history of a man, is a long unfolding record of his death. Because that part of his history, which is concerned primarily with his life, actually occurs before he is born. In his prenatal period, man is growing. From the moment he is born, he is dying. The moment birth takes over, 
the forces of crystallization begin to set in. And in this process of gradual dying, man passes through varying degrees of death process. When he achieves what we call maturity, he has come to the fine point of the equilibrium between life and death. In that period, therefore, we regard him as having a maximum maturity and a maximum efficiency. But what do we mean? We mean that by the time he is 35 to 45 years of age, he has reached the point where his materiality is becoming established and his spirituality is already three quarters dead. We are coming to the point where through compromise of principles he is making economic progress that is satisfactory. He has already died out of something. He has died out of the dreams of youth. He has died out of a great many hopes. He is becoming factual which is another term for crystallized. Therefore, the history of our peoples, the history of the world as we know it, is the gradual process of man dying. Now, it cannot be a total picture because men are forever being born. But a moment an institution, a system, an ideological structure comes into existence, that moment it begins to die. So we have the long record of things fading away. And the things that fade first are the memories, apparently, of old things, of first things. Because in the struggle of life, we forget the dreams of youth. So by degrees, we reintegrate or reorganize our concepts, becoming ever more practical, ever more factual, discarding as lore, legend, and fairy tale things that were once the real values of our lives. Thus we have at the root of history, legendary and law, golden ages and mysterious heavenly abodes. And as we got wiser and wiser, which means in this case deader and deader, we began to forget these things and lose them. First thing you know, we began to say these legends are for children. But children are the young, children are the alive. Therefore there is an aliveness gradually fading away. And Pike makes a long and careful study of this aliveness. He makes a very painstaking research to show why and how each generation has persecuted the prophets. How each generation has little by little revised and restored and reinterpreted and reintegrated and every time it did it something was lost. Until finally, great things were reduced to the ignorance of man, which is the exact reverse of our basic process. Instead of man rising to greatness, he drew greatness down to himself until it became less and less great. And the less great it became, uh, the more willingly he accepted it. But when it reached a certain degree of not being great, it became such a caricature of itself that man began to ridicule the procedure and reject the very things uh, which he had himself had brought about. Thus out of the gradual degeneration of things also rose skepticism or a general disillusionment about knowledge or the essence of fact itself. This position causes Pike to look back and he would like to find uh, or like to believe from his researches that the great structure of this basic doctrine was in a strange pristine purity between seven and ten thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era, perhaps much longer. But he wants to be as conservative as he can. He believes that this uh, revelation, this basic knowledge, preceded the first of the Zoroasters. He believed that they drank at its fountain as all others did. He believes very definitely that the entire philosophy of the uh, Zoroastrian doctrine is rooted in this thing, which like the mysterious principle uh, at the root of Zoroastrianism itself, an absolute, an infinite, an ultimate and utter state of existence. That this in eternal life itself was man's primordial symbol of eternal wisdom. 
that this mysterious power at the very source of things, Ahura Mazda, or whatever level, he goes beyond and behind that concept also, but that this creating power, the source of all wisdom, the one who communicates to his saints and sages, the mysterious power that is forever the oracle, was not merely the voice of a deity, not merely something that appeared in thunders, but was actually a statement of the existence of a holy order, a sacred body of enlightened beings, human by nature, with a strange but total penetration into reality. And that everything that has since followed has come from that and has gradually in the course of time fallen away from that until we have relatively forgotten uh, the original teachings of the ancient ones of the earth. Now let us see how Pike would proceed with this because he realized that he would be open to criticism for such a statement. He would realize that someone would say, but these persons could not have known this. They could not have known that. Certainly we have made some advancements in knowledge. Certainly as we look back we find indication of man living in a more and more primitive state. Certainly the whole trend of our concept is that man has arisen from darkness into light. Pike, however, doesn't think so. Pike says man has fallen from light into darkness because of a false estimation of what constitutes light or perhaps a false definition of the meaning of darkness. Whichever term you wish to use, man has come to a false explanation of the meaning of the term or a false concept of origin based upon it. Now Pike then points out another interesting uh, situation, namely that when we would destroy truth, we must complicate it. We must make it difficult. And the more difficult we make it, the more difficult it is for anyone to find out anything. Of course, Pike does not use the story, but I think I have told it, but it is a rather cute one, to the effect that one day uh, two men were walking along side by side, one a human soul and the other the devil. And right in front of them was another man walking by himself. And the man in front leaned over and picked up something, looked at it and slipped it in his pocket. And the man with the devil said, what did he pick up? And the devil said, oh, this man has just found a small grain of truth. The man with the devil said to him, well, that's going to make it pretty tough for you, isn't it? The devil said, oh, no, I'm going to help him organize it. <laughs> now, Pike's thinking on this is exactly this point. He says, he says, we assume that the motion from the primitive to the sophisticated is evolution. And Pike says, I doubt it very, very severely. I think we have longer words to say it with than ever before, but I do not think we know as much about what we're saying. Gradually, by degrees, we have fallen into this opinionism, which, as Heraclitus says, is the falling sickness of the reason. And as a result, we know much about many things and very little of the fact beneath things. So Pike, going back to the beginning, says it wasn't necessary for this ancient body, whatever it may have been, to have been able to square the circle. They didn't need to know trigonometry and calculus. They did not need to write histories. They did not need to compile philosophies. They did not need uh, to develop or originate religions per se. For the simple reason that all of these things belong finally, not to the spreading of wisdom, but man's combating of ignorance. Instead of assuming that these are the way man came to know, actually they were the ways in which man began to search for something lost or something that he believed to be knowable, but which in its substance eluded him. Therefore, direct knowledge, the only knowledge that is true, 
the knowledge that carries with it the total internal experience of fact is a kind of knowledge we know nothing about and we have almost no way of assuming that that essential knowledge is related to the economic, social, or political development of peoples. That this knowledge, uh, like the intuitive power of a child, might be truer and righter than any knowledge that is later conferred upon that child by education and culture. Thus, the ancient ones of the earth were those in Pike's thinking who were the natural knowers. Those who had not been led into error and therefore did not have to be led out of it. They, he assumed that man naturally was endowed with faculties for the purpose of experiencing truth and not for the purpose of fighting ignorance. That until man himself created ignorance it did not exist. For ignorance is an artificial state in nature. Ignorance is not necessary. It originates in false instruction. It originates in systems by means of which man's intuitive and natural faculties are blunted, in which he loses the capacity for the immediate apprehension of fact, and must therefore depend for knowledge upon sharing the opinions of others. Pike therefore refers to these ancient ones of the earth as the lodge of the old teachers, the holy ones of old, those to whom we have constant reference. And he points again to his circumference, and he points out that every religion and philosophy of man traces itself back to a period of legendary and lore when wisdom was universal. In other words, we can think perhaps of the Greek just as a simple example. But in the beginning was the golden age when there was no poverty, no ignorance, no sickness, no suffering, and no death. This was the divine era. In the ancient childhood of the world, in the oldest Hindu writings, we find originally this world ruled benevolently and eternally by the gods. There was no disobedience, there was no sin. Although the point is rather congested in the opening chapters of Genesis, this point also exists that a pre presumably the original man lived in a paradisical garden and here the Lord walked with him in the evening and he was not ashamed and he was in communication with the creating powers that had fashioned him and brought him into existence. The same is true of the Egyptian religion for in the dawn of things there was the golden age, the age of peace and joy the age before the gods retired to their Olympian strongholds, the age in which nothing but life and peace and happiness prevailed. We find it even among savage people. We find it among our American Indian tribes. For in most of their little local legends, although they are feeble in comparison to the great theological systems of the classical nations, they all begin with the idea that man was happy. They none of them begin with the fact that he was miserable. Nearly all of the systems, and Pike enumerates probably 20 or 30 of them, they all declare that man began in peace, that for thousands of years, millions of years, perhaps aeons of time, there were no wars. Then in one way or another, rebellion set in. There was war in heaven. Some of the angels resi resisted their Lord, and uh, there was the battle between Michael and Lucifer in the uh, old Jewish legendary. Someone became selfish, someone became corrupt, and the great and splendid pageantry of the divine will was mutilated and deformed and in measure destroyed by the rise of human will. 
A man's own egoism, his own selfishness, his own determination to live his own way gradually caused the golden age to die. Point makes one point, however, is well taken. That if we accept that legendary and mythology and law belongs to a kind of subconscious memory of man, a memory which psychology perhaps says goes back to human infancy with its irresponsibility. But this again, only symbolic of collective infancy, the rise and dawn of peoples. He is as correct in assuming, at least, that all of the great systems of the world agree on this point. They agree that there was a time when man knew that Adam could name all his creatures according to their natures and their attributes, that the ancient ones uh, communicated with mankind, and in practically every great system of legendry, in the dawn of things, gods walked the earth with men. But we do not know just exactly how this is explained in things like the Eldorada, or the Sigurd Saga, or the Friedhof Saga or the Kalevala, or any of these great epical works based upon the ancient legendary and lore of peoples. We have it in Japan, in the Nohingji and the Kojiki. We have the great sacred writings of the days when the gods ruled the world and men lived in peace. Thus, in the root of things, Pike seemingly took the attitude that all this legendary and lore did not relate merely to a theological abstraction or to some mythological hope or some escape mechanism in man, but that it related distinctly and definitely to a period in which the ancient doctrines, the great wisdom, was directly available to the human being. Directly available to him because he then possessed, by the nature of infancy, the total kind of purity, the total kind of innocence, by means of which he was without sin. Meaning, of course, if we want to go back to the Chaldean and follow Pike's thinking, without sin means not moonstruck, because sin was the ancient goddess of the moon. Therefore, without lunacy, without the moon madness, without this strange thing that led man into illusion, for which the moon was an ancient symbol. Regardless of how we want to think of it, let's see how Pike now begins to defend his position. He defends his position by pointing out that as each of the streams left this central core land, and began to establish themselves as separate nations and peoples, began to cause the rise of what we might term existence on an individualized basis, that the first thing that each of these groups did was to restore or recreate or perpetuate uh, what uh, he is referred to by Socrates in this quotation which I read, the state mysteries. Now the state mysteries lie not at the decadence of people, but at their roots. For by the time of the Orphics, 12, 1400 years BC, the great mysteries of the Greeks were already in decline. By the rise of the Osirian cycle in Egypt, the great mysteries of the Egyptians had fallen, been revised, reformed, regenerated, and fallen again a double dozen times. Twenty groups leaving an area all perform the same action. May we safely assume that the area from which they came was unaware of that action, in the sense of never having performed a similar action. May we assume that a certain pattern would proceed out of a center, but the center itself would be unaware of the pattern. Would it be possible that these migrants uh, would have carried something with them that did not exist in the place they came from? And as all of these peoples did bring this, Pike is of the assumption that somewhere in the background of this great Indo-Aryan or Iranian-Aryan culture, 
was the archetype of the great house of the mysteries. That this great house of the mysteries was not necessarily a temple, was not necessarily a great building. Perhaps it was the mysterious grotto, ornamented with stars, into which it is said the Zoroasters disappeared and remained in a kind of waitingness to return. Perhaps it was almost anything. Perhaps it was later symbolized by the great institute of Miro in India. But whatever it was, Pike was convinced that it represented an assembly or an aggregate of enlightened and informed persons who at that time were responsible for the great pattern which was to arise in the religious and philosophic and even scientific worlds. Inasmuch as the roots of all knowledge were in this core, even though the knowledge itself was as yet undeveloped by man. If Pike is correct, and he gives a great deal of supporting evidence that is rather difficult to refute, to say the least, then he takes the position that the great sages, the great scholars, and he wisely points out that these words that we use now have no real meaning in this pattern, that it represents a quality or a condition of enlightened beings totally different from our concept of the term enlightened beings, because we're using our own words for something else. But the, the best we can say is that there existed a core of Noah's whose knowledge was real, whose knowledge was relatively at least absolute, whose knowledge exceeded that of any age that has followed them, and that the whole great search is the effort to recover it. Now, uh, we might say that this is a very retrogressive look that what we are actually looking for is a great and brilliant future and not an illustrious past. But Pike would cut through that entire point and in his discussion of the matter of time he brings out this very simple situation that the individual who falls under the illusion of past, present, and future is defeated already. He will never find because he is now applying time to a situation that is timeless and that therefore nothing that is real is old or new. The fact that it existed 50,000 years ago does not make it old. The fact that it may be more completely realized 50,000 years from now does not mean that we will discover anything new. For that which is, like the eternal nature of being itself, is eternal. Therefore, we are quibbling when we talk about truth going out of fashion, or old-fashioned or new-fashioned truth. The only thing that can ever go out of fashion is untruth, and we're in trouble until it does. Consequently, what we are not searching for is a dead past. We're not searching for that at all, nor are we striving to bring a dead past to life. What we are searching for is that eternal truth that to our perceptive powers has been locked in a past. Locked there as in a sarcophagus. Buried there, not by the gods, but by man. And that it is the rolling away of the stone that lets out not an ancient truth or a new truth, but the truth which is as new as now and as old as eternity. Consequently, what we are searching for is solution, not dating. We are searching for the eternal answer to the immediate problem, because the only answer to any problem is eternal. Any urgent answer, any compromise, any answer that is based merely upon passing situations can never be the answer to anything because such false answers become themselves unanswerable questions in their own turn. So we have to, we have to search for this basic point. Pike then quotes from the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroasters to carry on his thinking. 
He is searching now for the farther fountains of the ancient wisdom. He is perfectly willing to assume that this wisdom existed originally apart from man at all. But that apart from man, it has no meaning to man. A universal wisdom, a completely independent of human need and human problem, becomes unintelligible to us. We can only affirm that it can exist. Therefore, wisdom, as far as man is concerned, is universal truth in that part of itself which is applicable to man, useful to man, necessary to man, assimilable by the faculties of man, and capable of being understood by man. Thus man is surrounded with absolute truth, but he can only nourish his own need on that part of truth which relates to his kind, to his species, uh, to the situation unique to humanity itself. And under those conditions, out of an eternal reservoir of eternal fact, man has to draw that part which means the solution to himself. Thus the eternity of truth is not assailed, nor the divinity of it, nor that it rests forever in the divine mind and in the divine knowing. The primary purpose with uh, consideration is that part of eternal truth which relates to man. Therefore Pike now points out another issue of importance. Namely, that every one of the faiths that originated somewhere in this great complex of areas has, as one of its essential principles, the doctrine of mediation, the appearance of a link, an appearance of a prophet, an interpreter, one who receives the divine instruction and then communicates it. And that this divine teacher, in Pike's estimation, has two distinct meanings. Namely, the teacher always finally becomes identical with teaching. That we cannot actually identify a person apart from the thing he did, particularly in these matters. Because as far as the stream which moves through him is concerned, there is no clear identification. We are dealing now not with man as man, but as with man or a man as the symbol of mediation between eternity and time, between universals and particulars. And Pike points out the idea that teacher becomes the total of teaching and that therefore at the root of every doctrine, every faith that arose in this region is this first established point, namely the adaptation of universal knowledge to man through the arising of an instituted structure of teaching and that this teaching takes out of space as a prism such forms of light as it can capture and reflects these lights upon other things in order that they may in turn be able to examine this light more completely and more intelligently. Pike therefore tells us in his belief that the great orders of mediators or the great personal mediator between God and nature is always symbolic of these ancient ones of the earth and of the institution which they created by means of which they captured the fire of heaven and made it available to man. They did not capture the full flame. They did not take all the fires from the sky to light their altars. They lit their altars and the great fire remained. But the little fire upon their own altar was the symbol of a strange and mysterious comradeship or a strange and mysterious relationship 
between the fire and the total flame, between the light and the total sun. Thus, uh, the uh, ancient altar, in his estimation, was symbolic of the altar that was set up on the earth. The great focus by means of which knowledge in its true and proper nature uh, came to man is the miniature of the great flame, that part of the eternal fire which he could use. But as Zeus appearing to Semele destroyed her in a catastrophe of flames, so that part of reality which is not applicable to man beyond his power, beyond his need, still remains the great blazing totality in space. But man has taken from the total fire that warmth which is necessary for his own need. Thus this ancient concept involves the principle that these ancient ones of the earth formed a kind of lodge, formed a kind of assembly, formed uh, the equivalent of what the Kabbalists later called the sod, the assembly, uh, the gathering of the great ones, and that these form the nucleus of the universal structure of truth, as this truth was applicable to men, and that it was not only the promise of these teachers that they would remain on that they would continue to come forth, but that age after age they would be restored, and that they would continue this strange and mysterious procedure until truth was restored as the sovereignty over all that lives, that the war between light and darkness would ultimately end, that evil would be not destroyed but reconverted, brought back into humble identity with truth, that darkness and light uh, would no longer be enemies, but that darkness would be the servant of light. And in another strange way, as, point, as Pike points out, light must in the end trust itself to the infinite benevolence of darkness, that these things are not friends and enemies anymore but that when truth comes, the war in heaven and the war on earth both come to an end and the golden age is restored. What then happened to the ancient body, this mysterious structure? Plato, I think, gives us a clue to this in the story of the lost Atlantis. For in a strange way, the Atlantic Empire was a symbol of something. The great king of Atlantis, according to Plato, was Atlas, who has later become known as the man who carries the heavens on his shoulders. In other words, the ancient thing, the old world, disappearing in the waters of time and illusion, the submerged continent that went to sleep in the deep, this strange submergence is actually a kind of deluge in which truth was drowned with error. Yet truth, lying beneath the surface of error, becomes the very foundation of restoration. Though the lost world of antiquity has simply been drowned into another kind of world. It has never ceased. It has simply been submerged. As man developed his external propensities and powers, his psychic and mystical propensities retired more and more deeply into himself. They apparently were lost, like a lost continent. The soul was lost in the body, but the soul did not die. It remained hidden beneath the surface of things. Truth was lost in error, but truth did not die. It is merely concealed by the veil of error drawn across its face or at least it is drowned in a water of illusion, but it lies like the ancient city beneath the surface of the ocean that men could look down and see the roofs. 
So in the in, in Pike's thinking, the great order of the wise never actually ceased. It never became any different from what it was. It couldn't, because the wise themselves could never be felt foolish or never become so. That which possesses truth, truly and actually, can never lose it. Therefore, behind and below the surface of things stand forever the strange figure of the totally illumined mediator, the God-man, the man-God, the ancient ones of the earth, those who knew, can never have ceased to know. The great uh, philosophies and principles which they taught can never have ceased to be themselves. But over the surface of them has been drawn this strange tracing of error until we can no longer see them. And we have even taken their lives and their teachings and deformed them. But though we deform them a thousand times, we can never change one whit of their substance. It remains forever. But man, having by his own ways divided himself from these great shadowy forms, we have another series of legends which bear upon this, of ancient teachers that returned to the sky, of sages that walked off into the mysterious cities of the north, a Laozi on his green water ox, going off into Gobi to the land of the sages to wait. Always apparently these sages retire. They go back. They promise, however, always that they will return. Always the Great One will come back when the time is right, when the, those who are ready call him back. When the virtues fail upon the earth, he will come forth again. Always the promise. The promise that the mediator is not dead, but sleepeth. And will re return and restore the beauties and perfections of his faith, if his people keep the faith. We have the same thing in the Adventism of Christianity, the second coming of Christ. The idea that the Great One will return. But always your truth symbol keeps the covenant by a second coming, which seems to imply, beyond all doubt, a first appearance. And the restoration of truth as a term means the restoring of that which has already been, not that which has never existed. So Pike tells us in his thinking that beneath the surface the great association of the light still functions. And he believed that at some remote period, maybe six or seven thousand years ago, the first revelations of this ancient body that we know of, the first revelations flowed into Persia and flowed into the Indo-Gangetic plain, and that therefore that the two great structures, the Avestas and the Vedas, constitute perhaps the earliest and most total revelation of this thing that all men are still seeking. He was convinced that then the streams continued to flow, flowing into many directions, and that in all these flowings, there was a root in reality, but that as the streams flowed forth, mixed and mingled, passed over various types of earth and gathered impurities, their currents became abrupted and broken, rapids came, the waters were muddy and defiled, and in the end, men used these streams merely to till their fields rather than to redeem their souls, and that the great stream of this faith gradually disappeared into the earth like water after rain until man can no longer find it. And that in the place of it he has a great group of secondary institutions built upon the ethical phases of the ancient faith but without the keys to its ancient doctrine. In discussing the subject of the, uh, of the Zoroastrian fire principle uh, Pike also comes to certain conclusions that he regards as very important. 
He tells us, deriving much of his thinking from his own acquaintance with transcendental magic, he tells us that fire uh, is not only an, a symbol of deity, not only a symbol of purification, not only a symbol of light, not only a, an emblem of the sun, it is more than any and all of this. Fire is the symbol of the great chemical agent. Fire is the symbol of the power that works the great alchemical regeneration. Fire is actually, therefore, the tremendous agent, the master builder. Fire is represented in some legendary in the heroic figure of Tubal Cain, the ironmonger, the man who is able to pound the swords into plowshares. Fire is the tempera of iron, and by means of it, iron is hardened into steel, and from this steel is fashioned the sword Notong, the sword of the Valsuman. It is also the sword Excalibur, the mysterious sacred emblem of the Arthurian cycle. And it is finally that sword of quick detachment, by means of which we are able to take the snaky branches of the banyan tree and cut them off, freeing ourselves from illusion. And it is also the sword of Damocles, hanging over the banquet of Dionysus of Syracuse, the hair, uh, the sword suspended by a single hair, which can fall and destroy man. It is the two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of the great figure of Revelation. It is the sword, the golden blazing sword of the cherubs guarding the gates of Eden. This sword is a flame. This flame is itself a symbol of the great art, the tremendous science by means of which all things passing through the fire are made new. There is a strange meaning. This fire is also the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This fire which burns forever upon the altar of the human being is the fire of life, the fire in the blood, the fire in the heart, which is truly the altar, the living altar of the soul. But this fire to Pike was a symbol by means of which he was convinced that the signatura rerum, the seal, the true signature of the great order, which lay at the root of things, was stamped upon the ancient peoples who worshipped it, knowing why they worshipped, knowing the mystery of fire, knowing as the ancient Rosicrucians knew how to make fire burn in water, and how to make water feed fire as a fuel. That behind all of this, was the statement of the science that later came into existence in alchemy, in hermetic philosophy, in Kabbalism, in Buddhism, in the Vedanta, in the yogic doctrines of Patanjali, the fire, this mysterious power, which if it be lifted up and subjected to the rules of science, will draw all things unto it. Therefore, that by the fire was now meant the operative mystery of truth. That while many things are speculative, the fire by its own virtue and its own symbol becomes the difference between the fire of truth and the cold light of intellect. That it becomes this, the power of the universe made available to man so that he may see in the night of his own ignorance. This fire man did not invent. He merely released it. 
the wisdom of the great ones of the earth man does not create he releases it it comes to his knowing because it is always present and becomes either the consumer of him or the enlightener of him the great art then is that this fire must burn away the dross that this fire must temper the weak metal that this fire must be fed upon body until it becomes master of body consuming all things that are not itself this is then the mysterious fire of the Samadhi and the Nirvana of Buddhism it is the symbol of the great art it is a symbol of the science of human perfection Pike gives us innumerable references to this and builds much of his symbolism upon the conviction that this is the basis that without the true knowledge of the fire man labors in vain and that this fire therefore belongs peculiarly and wonderfully to the central core mystery of being that man began as the spark from the flame that man actually first raised his altars to the fire and whether he outwardly and intellectually knew it or not he was stating the nearest thing to absolute truth that he was able to conceive at that time and ever since then he has been taking something away from it he has never added to it because he chose in the beginning perhaps the truest symbol that he could possibly have devised therefore says Pike we now have not simply a central geographical region surrounded by a group of peoples we have a central psychographical quality represented now by the ever burning fire the fire which according to legend has never failed even though historically perhaps it has but this fire is now surrounded by a series of other fires that have been lighted by its torch and wherever this fire springs up it seems to tell us that the one torch lit it and this circumference of fires gradually spreading on and on like the mysterious campfires in the sky of the ancient Sioux warrior waiting for death these fires going on have created roads or paths because the way they traveled becomes a road for anyone who wishes to travel back consequently in all parts of the world there is pilgrimage pilgrimage back to the father fountains back to the parent fire and around the fire is a wall a great structure to protect the holy place like the strange uh, walls around the tabernacle in the wilderness walls have been built to guard the sanctuary that the profane may not enter and these walls in pipes thinking are the walls of faiths that they are not actually enemies of the fire they are guardians they stand uh, almost like armed cherubs guarding the twelve gates to the holy land of truth and these cherubs with flaming swords will not permit the uninitiated to enter in to the sacred ground therefore these religions have gradually become systems of discipline they have become ways of purification they have become the proneos of the temple the outer part the porch and no one can enter the sanctuary who does not first pass through the porch to be challenged by the guardians like those who entered the ancient Egyptian mysteries and unless they have the right word unless they are able to prove their fitness to go on the door does not open and they remain outside only those who are permitted to pass these gates uh, have right of entry Pike points out in 1878 that it's a little a pity 
that religions have not recognized this very significant point that they, like the flaming cherubs, are the guardians of something superior to them all. And that therefore, this idle controversy as to which one is the holiest among them is one of the worst wastes of time in history, and furthermore, the greatest cause of cruelty perhaps the world has ever known. That in attempting to vie with each other, they have forgotten that they were created to stand guard. They were created as gates, leading not to themselves, but through themselves, to that which was the substance of them all. That discovering this substance, that man was then, perhaps more than ever before, capable of being grateful to the paths that he had walked. One of the Eastern teachers once has said that any good disciple can outgrow his master, but that he can never outgrow the gratitude that he owes his master. And those that teach us along the way, the great gates through which we pass, we may pass through them. But if each of these sanctuaries has been a good and faithful servant of the eternal, we shall ever be grateful that it stands. And though we may pass into other things, we shall still defend it with a whole heart and feel the nobility and significance of the purpose which it serves. If, however, we accept each of these gates as the substance rather than the shadow of the substance and become hopelessly involved in each as a separate thing, the great blazing altar of the rail goes unattended. A man has not achieved the great identity of his own spiritual aspiration. So these gates become the natural doors, the mysterious twelve gates in the city of the New Jerusalem. And through these gates men can move. But these gates are each of them marked with tests, with trials, with obligations. And these obligations are not, as we have been told or have been taught to think, that they are not the arbitrary dictates of a deity who tells us that we must go hungry when we want to eat or that we must be miserable in order to be virtuous. That is not the concept at all. These trials exist for only one purpose, namely that they represent the undergraduate work in the University of Truth. We have to face them as such. The trial is given to us not because we are sinners or we are born in sin and conceived in iniquity. The trial is given to us because we are truth seekers. And in order to achieve the truth we seek, we must become the truth we seek. Therefore, these tests, these trials, these disciplines, are absolutely indispensable to those who would approach the flame. For if those who approach the flame are not so disciplined, so that the dross in their own natures has not been voluntarily removed, then they approach the flame with combustible material and will find not the light of ages but a consuming fire, because the dross cannot survive the flame. Therefore it is the duty of man to remove the dross before he approaches the flame. If not, the experience is painful rather than helpful. So ethics represents merely the outer shadow, the exoteric name for discipline. Men do not do these things for the benefit of each other. They do not do these things primarily, actually, for the benefit of themselves as persons. They do these things in the name of and in the cause of the truth without which they cannot live or survive. So Pike points out that in his estimation that circle of ancient guardians actually existed. 
And by degrees, through the passing of time, we have forgotten that they were indeed a circle, God in a sacred place. And because that thing which was in the center of that place was not a vast cathedral built by men, was not a wonderful holy city leaving ten layers of ruin for us to excavate, but because that thing in the center was mostly life, pure life, it was easy to forget it because we couldn't see anything with our objective senses. We could not sense the magnitude unless we achieved it. Thus the center gradually ceased to exist as far as we are concerned. Our own ignorance caused us to miss the implication entirely. And we began to make each of these gates centers in themselves. And we had many centers, therefore many faiths, rather than many gates to one. Then, of course, followed the general confusion of tongues, confusion of minds, and confusion of souls. And it became possible for men to kill each other in the name of God. It became possible for them to persecute each other in the name of truth because the center was gone. And without that center, each thing standing by itself alone was inadequate, unreal, imperfect. The loss of the consciousness of the center made it possible for us to be fanatics, made it possible for us to be bigots. Whereas the realization of that center would have preserved the great and magnificent geometrical harmony of the divine plan. Having missed the point, we did not, however, uh, miss it without some redeeming factors that we realized it, because these gates were originally created with the correct purpose. Pike is convinced that they were, and he is also convinced that these gates, uh, when in the course of ages a faith failed or a religion ceased, and therefore a gate was left untended, that immediately out of the structure of the general pattern new gatekeepers came, who were also to remain the custodians of these gates. Therefore all religions were not founded at exactly the same time as separate sects. They might be founded over a period of 20,000 years, yet still actually they are those gates, and the gate factor itself never changes. Having uh, recognized that all existing faiths were either founded upon the original plan or founded by branching from those who were part of the original plan, that a strange, semi-lost continuity has continued, and that the old mystery temples, which flourished as late in the, in the East, uh, rather in the Near East, and in the Mediterranean areas as the 3rd and 4th and 5th centuries of the Christian era, that these mystery temples were aware, at least in part, of their kinship with the ancient roots. Furthermore, these older temples did keep a certain roadway open between themselves and from the uh, travels of Pythagoras and later of Apollonius Tyanus and other of the great initiates of the period, we know that these persons traveled from one of these great centers to another with adequate passports, that they traveled as persons known and expected. When Apollonius reached the northern parts of the Ganges, uh, river, the northern, the headwaters, the Ganges, he found there the Indian teachers waiting for him, already aware that he was coming. Now some may say perhaps they were just clairvoyant. Perhaps they were, but it was at least one point. He came not as a stranger, but as one expected and awaited, and one welcomed. In those days, this relationship between these groups was not hopelessly lost. They had not become creed-bound. They had not said, my God against thy God, 
or they already had achieved and had maintained, as Pythagoras tells us, the realization that in all the various areas that he visited, and he visited over 20 of the great religious systems of, the, of Europe, the Near East, the Far East, and North Africa, that they all taught the same doctrine and they all knew it. And that was as late as 550 B.C. They knew it. And yet, in the intervening 2,400 years, this knowledge has been generally lost. So we have an interesting evidence that knowledge has gotten lost even after history has been able to record it. Pike is therefore convinced, and I think he has a very strong story in his behalf, that this knowledge of being waves leading in to this great central fire core, this knowledge existed, probably uh, generally known as late as Plato and Socrates, perhaps a little later. Less generally, but somewhat widely known, as late as the 6th century AD. Still known in some areas to the present time but comparatively unknown to what we call Western culture. That this factor is known in Asia and in North Africa, I have reason to believe. I discussed some of these problems with some very learned cops in Cairo, and they assured me that these facts were fully known to them. But these peripheral groups almost untouched by the rapid so-called progress of the Western way of life. These are not listened to anymore, any more than are a few of the learned Sufis and dervishes who also know, nor certain of the very learned Taoists and Zen monks who also know. These things are not totally unknown. They are totally ignored by the majority of Western peoples. But the concept leads into the next important point, and that is that from the ancient mysteries we have by natural heritage, as Pike points out, in incorporating part of this ritualism and symbolism into the Scottish degrees of Freemasonry, Pike points out that into this uh, modern uh, knowledge and we can read it in Iamblichus on the Mysteries, in Proclus on the Theology of Plato, in the Eleusinian and Bacchic Mysteries, the Mysteries of Mithras, and many others, that these rituals are what we might term the gates, are still known. That there is this gate a doctrine of awareness, the Zen concept, of the mystery of the gateless gate. That this gate knowledge is still available. And Pike points out that it will always remain the same. In one generation it may be forgotten and another remembered. Perhaps sometime Vishnu must be born again to bring the law out of the depths of the ocean where it had been stolen away by giants. But regardless of what happens to the law, the law remains, and man must come finally to the old road that leads to the law. And these ancient institutions, the mysteries, gradually bestowed part of their insight, but only a part, upon the rising theological systems that succeeded them in most areas. But each time this uh, transmission was made, something was obscured by a heavier layer of symbols until it became less and less easy to see the facts. But Pike points out that once you possess the key, not necessarily the great key that unlocks all truths, but now merely the point of view which is the key, the discrimination to recognize landmarks as some of the Freemasonic brethren call them, if we can see and recognize the landmarks, 
we will recognize the fact that no faith has ever been without them. We can also recognize that in every generation, in every religion, a few have recognized them and have quietly gone into this quiet search along the mysterious thread of Ariadne that led out of the labyrinth of confusion into the broad light of common sense. Out of all this consideration, then, Pike tells us the essential remains. The mysteries, as we knew them then, have mostly fallen ruin in time. They have, however, bestowed themselves as moral forces and as intangible but real values upon those things that succeeded them. And these, in turn, have, in one way or another, perpetuated often without knowing it, certain peculiar doctrines, certain particular arrangement of emblems and patterns, whether in music, in art, in literature, or architecture, or scripture, science, philosophy, religion, these different groups have all perpetuated the key. The only problem is to find it, to get it out again. And the key, there's always the road that leads to the gate. And at the gate, through the mystery of initiation, supplies the pass sign by means of which the individual can pass into the ancient temple where he can come finally into the sanctum sanctorum or the aditum of the house. The great central place in which stands alone the flaming symbol of the eternal. Thus the search is for this, and Pike, being a scholar in these things and a great researcher, realizes that the secret societies of the ancients were therefore the elementary schools, so to say, leading into this knowledge. That their primary purpose was to give man the moral and ethical indoctrination by which he became capable of discriminating value, by means of which he could finally say with Omar, uh, referring to the mysterious dances of the dervishes, Omar says, from my base metal shall be filed the key that shall unlock the door they howl without. And that is the problem. The purpose of these systems of religion extended from the mystery systems is to proceed to the regeneration of man within certain limits, the gradual restoration of the good word, the good deed, and the good thought, the gradual beginning of the purification of the individual by which, through the cultivation of the upright life, through the actual practice of self-control and self-discipline, through the application of proper principles to every action of conduct, the individual gradually gains the first thing that he needs, namely the power to govern himself the power to dedicate himself, the power to place value above profit in everything, the power to choose self-sacrifice before the proclamation of truth, the power gradually to make the recognition of the value of reality strong enough to impel the person to go forward to the attainment of that which he has discovered. It is not from hope of heaven or from fear of hell that man must develop virtue. He must develop it because without it he cannot sufficiently regenerate his own organism so that he is capable of the great mystery ritual of truth seeking. Pike therefore points out that having passed through a certain tempering in the lesser fires, 
the spirit is strengthened, the resolution is strengthened. The individual gains gradual control of the mind and the emotions and the body. Until finally, through self-discipline, he is capable of attaining that internal integration, which is peace, which is security in the true sense of the word. And that as one in peace with all things, including himself, at in total peace with the world and with life and with reality, the individual thus completely at peace may pass through into the mysterious room beyond to find himself in the mysterious sanctuary of the ancient ones of the earth. He will then realize that he indeed has walked the path that all those who were truth-seeking, wise and good before him, have also walked. That he is walking the path of light. That he is therefore entering into the true religion. That he is seeking the everlasting fire and is finding it. And is satisfied to become the servant of that flame. And in so doing, he attains not to knowledge, in the common sense. He attains rather to identity with primordial knowing. He participates in the fact of truth as did ancient man before ignorance, sin and death came into his world. And because man has overcome ignorance, sin and death in himself, he then becomes also one of those ancient ones who is timeless, who belongs to the order of the mediators and becomes truly educated, truly enlightened, truly wise. This is the only wisdom there is. There is no other. And all the search for worldly wisdom leads in the end either to total disillusionment or else total dedication to that which is true. This was his, this was General Pike's central concept, and it seems to me that it is a valuable one, and I think for those of you who belong to the Masonic Order, it will have certain also special meanings. And so we thank you very much. We know that he lived in one of the most uh, turbulent periods in American history, and that he was in the middle of it that practically all of his life, until he finally retired to Washington, D.C., was in the field as a pioneer in law and letters, in poetry and in military strategy, and many, many other things. But in the year 1886, John Hallam was at that time writing his biographical and pictorial history of Arkansas. Um, uh, incidentally, Pike had been one of the first citizens of Arkansas. Begged General Pike to give him some facts concerning his varied and picturesque career. Pike complied with the request, remarking, I have often refused to write an autobiographical sketch for publication, not through delicacy or modesty, but because I could truly say with the needy knife grinder, story, God bless you, I have none to tell, sir. None I know that would be worth anyone's reading. I am perfectly conscious that I have no aptitude for that type of authorship, and that if I were to undertake it, the result would be stale, flat, and unprofitable. And General Pike, to the end of his life, insisted that nothing interesting had ever happened to him. <laughs> this is another uh, sidelight on a very interesting man, but shows uh, some of the peculiarities uh, that we often find with that type of person. I'll finally have all these things spread out just the way I want them. <laughs> now, uh, I want to uh, point out one uh, situation that Pike faced early in his studies of comparative religion because I think it has a direct bearing on us work this evening. Uh, while he was still practicing law in Arkansas, and recovering from the numerous trials and tribulations of the Civil War, he was working on his manuscripts 
And one of the most interesting of these is the Indo-Aryan deities and worship, in which he attempts a study of the Rig Veda. In introducing this subject, Pike goes over most of the available authorities of his time and points out that there is a serious difficulty which no one seems to have been able to uh, solve. And that is that we not only have to find out what the original author meant, but when we find out and we make even a most accurate and careful translation, we are still in no position to know that we have transmitted his idea. This is a, a very difficult situation because we have to use words that were unknown to him. We have to take concepts for which he had particular terms and we, had to, we have to try to find uh, some way of expressing things familiar to him in words that he never heard of. Now it's not only that we might be wrong, but he cannot uh, use censorship over the fact that his own language has changed. That even the most careful scholarship runs against a number of very difficult situations as I attempted to point out in one of the earlier talks building up to this particular point. And in order to explain his own position, General Pike gives us some interesting words and terms which we all use every day and then asks us what they mean. And so in this particular uh, context, I think it might be interesting to follow some of his friends or the small town people were a little outside of the odor of sanctity. They hadn't, it hadn't got there yet. So when we, uh, when we say to a man today, I think you're a heathen, I wonder if we really mean we think he lives on a wild heath and that also he is of Teutonic extraction. We probably do not. But when these words are used, uh, we have trouble with them. And we also have trouble wherever popular idiom gradually changes the meaning of things. A few more of his uh, thoughts here would also perhaps be pleasant. The word passion originally simply meant suffering. So when an individual is described as passionate, it means he is suffering severely. Now that, that may not be perhaps quite the meaning we have now, but that's what it originally means. Now Pike, perhaps by uh, the law of association as advanced by Dr. Seabury, also came to the conclusion that he should put the word libertine along with the passionate man. Perhaps this is just a, an idea. But what does the word libertine mean? We have an idea that it means an individual of loose morals. Maybe you'll be surprised to read, uh, to find that the original meaning is a free thinker. A libertine is an individual who dare to think his own thoughts a liberal. But hardly is that the meaning with which we associate the word today. The word plague, meaning now an epidemical disease or some malady of that kind, merely means to be struck a blow. Well, of course, actually, I suppose if you get the plague, it is a bit of a blow. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, uh, it means to strike a blow. And our word pain does not mean suffering at all. It means punishment. Well, perhaps it's true that many times our pain is a form of punishment. Perhaps the older man was wiser than we are. But when an individual says he is in pain, it means he is under punishment. But again, we have lost the meaning of that. I like the original meaning of the word obsolete. Uh, we think of it, for instance, as meaning something that is far behind, out of style, no longer used, and so on. It means, actually, that a thing has lost its odor. A bouquet of flowers which no longer have any scent might be said to be obsolete because it has to lose its savor, its smell, or its scent in order to be obsolete. Well, I don't know, but uh, that's a rather a stretch from our present um, meaning. We also have the word derivative which we incline to uh, term, uh, to relate to the term derive, or to come from. 
It actually means to take water out of the river. Now, you can imagine what you'd have to do when you start reading sacred books, trying to figure out the difference between popular meaning and real meaning, or between original meaning and surviving meaning. It could be very difficult. Attached means to put your finger out and touch something. It doesn't mean to take hold of it or to be fastened to it. It merely means to touch it. That, again, would be a form of attachment that would be rather gentle for our present thinking. We have the word firmamentum, uh, which we now tie with the concept of firmament or heaven. Originally, firmament was a foundation for a fort. It arises from our term fortis, which means to fortify or to make strong, and strength, prop, to hold up. We have noted on the other evenings that we would devote a little time to certain marginalia concerning General Pike and some of the points in connection with his life and research which we think may be of interest uh, to those of our students who are searching for better foundation work in early comparative religion. Well, when I was in Washington a number of years ago, it occurred to me that it was quite possible that Brady, the Civil War photographer, uh, who is famous for his photographs of Grant and Lincoln and other outstanding persons of the period, might have done something pictorially in connection with General Pike. Uh, the House of the Temple did not have any records that such were the case, but I browsed around Washington and I found, found out that Brady had taken some pictures of General Pike, and I was able to secure one which I think is not too bad, for it shows the general in one of his most natural and picturesque uh, postures, working with his oversized German pipe, which he uh, greatly favored. This is one of Brady's photographs of General Pike, taken probably in the early 80s, or when the general was, as he called it himself, in the prime of his advancing years, <laughs> which is a rather good term for it, I think. So I thought perhaps it would be nice to take, uh, show you this picture, and later why you can look at it more in detail if you wish to. We seem to be without any uh, place to put it, so we hope the general will not feel humiliated. I'm sure he would not. Now also in connection with this point, I'd like to uh, make a few remarks based upon an early uh, study of General Pike which records a phase of him which I do not find in any of his official biographies. This is by um, illustrious brother Henry Ridgely Evans, Grand Tyler of the Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. He says, General Pike was deeply versed in the philosophy of Vedanta. Now, this is something that we uh, perhaps might not be quite so uh, well acquainted with, and as much, of course, as this was many years before the great uh, World Congress of Religions, which brought the Swami Vivekananda to this country. And up to that time, only a very few individuals, perhaps Emerson and a few others, were really aware of this particular philosophy. The author of this article continues, with all his studies in the mysticism of the Orient, he, n he ever maintained his mental equipoise, his fine analytic and discriminating power. All that he wrote was tempered with philosophic insight. He fully appreciated the spiritual profundities of the Vedas and the Zendavesta, and sought to link the Orient with the Occident. He was indeed an emperor of the East and West, which incidentally is a Masonic term, whose true symbol was the double-headed eagle. Uh, this point that he was acquainted with and familiar with, a subject such as Vedanta, uh, sort of moves him again into a slightly different category when we are studying the things that he did. A little human episode, I think, is indicative of 
Pike's position, uh, the research is in words, just for maybe five minutes, to see how he approached a problem which most scholars have never yet been able to solve in a manner sac uh, satisfactory to others, even if satisfactory to themselves. As a very good scholar in Latin and Greek, uh, Pike chose a good many of his uh, terms for consideration at this moment uh, from these languages because of their gradual descent into our popular tongue. He starts here by using or giving us the word sacrament. Now there is a term which we think we know what it means. But let us see, according to uh, Pike, what the original word meant. Now supposing we found in a text the, uh, the Latin term sacramentum, just exactly what do we mean? Do we mean that this individual uh, took some holy and sacred obligation or something of that kind? Literally not. That is not the meaning of the word. Uh, the word means a deposit or a pledge made by a party in a legal suit in Rome. In other words, it begins as a legal term. Afterwards, it meant a military oath, usually an obligation to Caesar or the state. And after that, it meant any kind of an oath on any subject and finally moved into our uh, usage which actually does not mean an oath at all. We do not have the same meaning whatsoever. Now a word that we all use a great deal, Pike gives a little study to, and that is the word pagans. We now think of pagans as people whose faith is different from ours or who do not believe in one of the three religions to which we do not apply the term pagan, namely Christianity, Muslimism, and Judaism. All other religions we consider as pagan. Pike tells us, for example, that the Pagani were originally those people who lived in small villages and towns. That's what it means. Just a small town, folks. And that the uh, uh, that as Christianity in its development uh, gathered to itself more and more of those living in metropolitan areas or in the larger communities, uh, those who were, not, who were not converted were the ones in the small towns and in the distant places and in the villages and on the farms and things of that nature where the doctrine had actually not reached. Therefore, there, those who had not yet heard about it and therefore did not believe in it were the village dwellers or the pagans and that's all the term means actually it has nothing to do with whether you're a good man or a bad man or a true believer or a false believer it simply means that you lived out on a farm or in some small town where you did not enjoy the advantages of being able to listen to the sermons of the various preachers that's approximately all the word means but it certainly doesn't mean that anymore and if the word pagan has come into ill repute Pike points out the poor word heathen is in still worse trouble. <laughs> now what is a heathen? A heathen is supposed to be a false uh, person in false religious conviction. Therefore it may be interesting to know that the word heathen originally uh, meant one of the wild tribe of Germans who lived on the heaths. <laughs> In other words, it was a heath dweller, a person who lived uh, out in these great lands and, of course, something like the pagan. Well, it now means the sky, which you would, would scarcely be entirely in the original thinking. When we endorse a man's character, it means simply uh, that we do something on his back from in dorsal on the back so we can endorse a check on the back that is quite correct but when we endorse a man's character it means we would have to sign an affidavit on his back or something of that kind to make our meaning actually true our word disposition actually means to put in order and how many people's dispositions are worthy of that claim and finally Pike gives us the term provisions, now meaning food. 
from provisio, which simply means foresight. Therefore, foresight, uh, perhaps associated with the animal storing up its food for the winter, is the origin of our word provision. It does not mean actually food stuff now, but we think of putting away food stuff as foresight against hunger. Now, these are examples that he gives uh, to show what happens when you start trying to put languages together or take them apart for that matter and that it's much easier sometimes to take them apart than it is to put them together and he also points out that it is much easier to differ from the authorities than it is to correct them and that difference is easy but to come up with something that is really solutional is not quite so easy so this is another little insight, not only into his thinking, but perhaps into relatively important thinking for all of us in connection with the exactness of terms. Now in his researches into the Persian religion, Pike takes an attitude which perhaps is uh, rather important to us. It might, um, it might mean that before we get through with it, we'll spend a good deal of the evening on his attitude, but I think it is one that is essentially valuable and strangely enough he does not uh, uh, make this uh, basic concept from a quotation from the Avesta or one of the sacred books of the Persians but from the Phaedo of Plato he quotes Socrates where Socrates says of the, uh, the great uh, initiatory institutions of the ancients it well appears that those who established the mysteries or secret assemblies of the initiates were no contemptible personages but men of great genius who in the early ages strove to teach us under enigmas that he who shall go to the invisible region without being purified will be precipitated into the abyss while he who arrives there purged of the stains of this world and accomplished in virtue will be admitted to the dwelling place of the deity the initiated are certain to attain to the company of the gods this is from Socrates now this is basically uh, the premise upon which a very large part of his Avestan researches are based first of all then let us try to restore his thinking according to Pike uh, the researches in the early and basic religions of the Persians uh, have led him to certain conclusions. One is that what we call the stream of the ancient Persian wisdom